What's up guys? This is the second video in a three-part series on how to get started with the FreeCAD part design workbench. First thing we're going to do is jump into the sketcher and talk about some of the drawing tools. Then we'll go over the constraints and then we'll talk about best practices for using the constraints to create a stable model. All right, so let's jump right into it and get started. I've already got FreeCAD open here and I've navigated to the part design workbench. If you aren't sure how we got here, remember this is the second video in a three-part series. So I would encourage you to go back to the first video and uh, check out how we got to the part design workbench. In FreeCAD, to create a three-dimensional object, you first have to start with a two-dimensional sketch and then use some of these part design tools up here to manipulate it into the three-dimensional object. So to start a sketch, we're going to click right here. It's the Create New Sketch icon, a red square and a red circle. And immediately it asks us in the Tasks pane which plane we would like to start our sketch on. So if you rotate it a little bit, you can see that each plane corresponds to a different view. And we can select our view if you're unsure which plane it corresponds to with our navigation cube up here. We can easily navigate our view using this. So I'm going to select the top plane, and we're going to, which is the XY plane, and click OK. And then you'll notice that our tools have changed. We've been taken to the Sketcher workbench, and we've got a bunch of drawing tools here and a bunch of constraints. So first, let's go over the drawing tools. They're pretty basic. Um, we start with the line, and you can draw a simple line. Uh, this one's for an arc. You start with the center of a circle, create the radius, and then drag through the arc that you'd like. Um, then you have a circle here that you can create a circle with. The next one is an ellipse, which is just like an oval. Basically, you can choose how big you want it, rotate it around a little bit. Um, and then once you're given these points, you can use that to change the size and shape of the ellipse if you'd like. Um, this one is a more advanced function. It's called the B-spline, and it creates kind of curved objects using some kind of algorithm based on the distance that the points are from each other. So if you see if I get it closer, it kind of changes how that curve looks. Pretty cool if you want to create some interesting shapes and uh, curvature on your model. Um, then we have a, a one that, that I think is important that you'll probably use the most, um, at least I use it quite a bit, and that's the polyline. And the polyline is just like the line, but what it does is it'll create multiple lines without having to re-click. So I'll show you here, we've got one line. As soon as I click, it lets me create another line. So in the same click, it's stopping the previous line and starting the next line. And you can either finish by clicking back onto the point that you started, or any other point, or you can do it by right-clicking the mouse. The difference with that, between that and the line is, like I said, when I click once and I click twice, then it's gonna, I'm going to have to click that point another time to start another line. So it just saves you a click. It's kind of convenient. Um, then we have some other basic drawing tools up here with the square just like it sounds, creates a square. We've got the polygon tool. Um, it's set to hexagon right now, but you can choose whatever kind of polygon you'd like and just draw one out. So let's do the pentagon. Here we go. And you can see it creates a pentagon with equally sized sides. <clears throat> and then you have a slot here, which is just like what it sounds. Create a long slot. You can change the uh, characteristics of that slot with the points after you create it. So now we've got all of these, these cool shapes and lines here. Um, what do we do next? Well, now we would need to constrain them. And to con constrain them, you would use these red buttons here. Basically what that means is you want to keep it in the same place. So if I wanted to keep this point always on the same as the same place as this point, 
I could con connect those two points by selecting them both and clicking the coincident constraint. And that would jump them onto each other and they would always be connected. Whether I move this line or this line, they're always going to stay coincident. We have another constraint here that is fix onto object. So if I was to click this point here and this line and click fix onto object, then that, that point's always going to be on that line no matter where I move either one of them. This one we have is the vertical constraint. So if I was to click the vertical constraint, and now there's two ways you can do this. You can either click the line and click the vertical constraint, or you can click the vertical constraint and then select the line that you would like vertical. If you do it this, the, the latter way, it'll leave your vertical tool open so you can click more lines to become vertical. If you just select the line and then select vertical, it's going to go away with the first click and you'll have to keep going back and forth. So we've got the same thing here with the horizontal tool. If I click that and then I click horizontal on a line, it's going to constrain that line to becoming horizontal. We also have the parallel tool. So if I click parallel, I would select two, two lines. And those lines would always be parallel to each other no matter how I tried to move any of those lines or the lines connecting to them. Uh, we also have a perpendicular tool. So I'll draw another line here. And say we wanted these two lines perpendicular to each other. I could select them and select the perpendicular tool. And then no matter what, these lines don't even have to be touching. They would just always be perpendicular. And if I was to remove the parallel constraint, those lines would always remain perpendicular to each other no matter how I rotated either one of them. And here we have the tangent. Tangent uh, is usually done to a curved side, like an arc or a circle, and a straight line. It's going to fix the point, uh, uh, edge of the circle onto the line. So if I select the constraint there and I select the circle and a line, now you can see that they'll always be connected no matter where the circle is, how big it is, where I move the line. Um, the next one we have here is equal. So if I select the equal and two lines, those lines will always remain equal size. So those two are equal now, and you can see as I change the size of one of them, the other one's going to change its size, size as well. Kind of hard to see because they're moving so much, but you can see that they're changing size with each other. All right. Here's one. It's I don't know why it's my favorite. I just like to use it. It reduces the number of constraints you have to use quite a bit. Um, so that's the symmetric constraint. So it's a little bit trickier than some of the other ones. For the symmetric constraint, you have to select two points and one line. So if I select one point, two point, and then the third click has to be the line they're symmetric about, and then click the symmetric constraint, and those two lines are going to remain symmetric about that line. So we can do that. We can try it again. We'll click one point, one, another point, and then we'll click the line. And it's symmetric about that axis. So you can see if we move it, no matter how we move it, it's going to be symmetric. The last constraints here um, are interesting, um, to say the least. So these, these are the constraints you want to try and use the least amount of times as possible. So, for instance, this block and lock constraint, I hardly ever use those. Now, I'm not saying there's times that you won't need to use them because I'm, I'm sure you can come across something that, you know, you might need to use the lock or block constraint for. Um, but best practices, and we'll go over that in just a minute, um, say that you kind of want to use these, these ones uh, as little as possible. So you have the block constraint, and really the block constraint is only used 
I don't want to say only used, but it's typically used for a, a B spline. So when you have an interesting shape here, and that can get that can get kind of difficult to constrain, um, you would select it and then just select the block. Whoop, whoop. So you would select it. See if it's going to give me an error again. Of course it is. So the B spline is is constrained usually with these with a block, but I haven't used it too much. So let's see, there we go. Does that work? Yeah. See now it's locked. It looked like it worked there. So I don't know what that error was that it was just giving me, but it seems to have liked it now. Um, the next one is the lock constraint. Um, the lock constraint is used to just dimension something if you want it exactly where it is. So if I were to select one point and then lock it, it's going to dimension it from the origin. So you can see I had two dimensions now pop up, a vertical and a horizontal dimension that lock that point in place where it is. So that point won't move. If I want to lock these this side relative to this side I can select two points and then select the lock constraint and it's going to give me a vertical and a horizontal dimension relative to the second point that I clicked so it'll lock that into position like I said I don't like to use the lock and block constraints very often um, one is because I don't use B splines very often um, and the other is just because the lock gets really messy. You can see here, I've just used it twice and I've got all these dimensions here. Um, and the last few that I wanna show you are your actual dimensional constraints. So I'm gonna just get rid of everything here real quick. And I'm going to just draw a simple square and show you how to use these constraints here. So this is the horizontal constraint. So if I click that, and I click a horizontal line, and ask me how big I want the line. So we're gonna say 30 millimeter, press enter. And then if I want to dimension this line, I can click the vertical constraint and click that line. And let's say we want that another 30 millimeters. So there we go, we've got a 30 by 30 millimeter square. We can still move it around wherever we want. Um, but that's how you use the, the vertical and horizontal dimensioning tools. Um, and then you've got, if, if you have a line that's not vertical or horizontal, you can use this fix length, or is that, is that what it says? Yeah, fix a length, select the, the line, and then you can make that whatever size you want. Um, and you should still be able to rotate it because it's not a vertical or horizontal line. <clears throat> and then this last one here, um, actually there's two here still. So this is just to dimension a circle. If you want to fix the radius, you just click the circle. 30 millimeters, now we have a 30 millimeter radius. Um, and this one is an angle. So if we have a couple of lines here, and we want to put an angle between them, we would select the constraint, and we would select the two lines that we want the angle between, and we would tell it, hey, we want a 30 degree angle there. So that's how you use all of the constraints. Uh, now I wanna talk to you a little bit about best practices using the constraints. I already mentioned earlier that you want to use these dimensional constraints as little as possible. And I'm gonna give you a little example right now of how that's done. So say we wanted um, a square here. We wanted it to be a perfect square, so equal sides, and we want it to be centered on the origin. So there's a couple ways we could do that. The first way we could do that is come in, use our horizontal constraint, and say 30 millimeters. Then we could use our vertical constraint on the vertical side. Say we also want that 30 millimeters. So now we've got our 30 millimeter by 30 millimeter square. 
but we still want it centered on the origin. So we could say I want to give it a vertical constraint here. I could select the origin and one of the points and give it a 15 millimeter dimension. And then we could select the horizontal and give it another 15 millimeter dimension. And see, so you'll notice here now our square has turned green because now it's completely constrained. You'll see over here on the left side it says fully constrained sketch. That means our sketch has been dimensioned. It's fully identified in all of the three dimensional space. It can't move at all. But we've got we've used the dimensional constraints four times. That's not really what we want to do. Like I said, you want to use those as as little as possible. So I'm going to delete them here. And you can see over here our const our uh, sketch is now under constraint with four degrees of freedom. That's because it can move up and down, left and right, oh, left and right. So up and down, left and right, that's two dimensions or degrees of freedom. And then it can change the length of this direction and the length in this direction. So that's two more degrees of freedom. So it's, it's good practice to always have a fully constrained sketch with zero degrees of freedom. And we want to limit the amount of times that we use these dimensional constraints. So if we wanted a 30 by 30 millimeter square, the first thing we could do is come in and say, okay, I know I want this side and this side to be equal. And we'll use the equal constraint to do that. And then we can say, okay, I know I want it about the origin. And real quick, before I show you that, you can see over here, once we made both those sides equal, we lost a degree of freedom. So now we're down to three degrees of freedom. And now if I wanted to make it symmetric about the origin or centered on the origin, what I could do is select this point, select this point, and then select the origin, and I can use the symmetric constraint. And now you can see we've dropped to one degree of freedom, and we're centered on the origin. So that last degree of freedom is our dimension. So we can come here, we can use either the horizontal or the vertical, and give that a 30 millimeter dimension. Now you can see that we've used only one dimensional constraint and our sketch is fully defined using the other constraints that, that we have. That is how you create a sketch using best practices and it also makes your sketch very easy to come back in and edit later. If we wanted to edit the previous square we'd made with the four different dimensional constraints and we, we wanted to maintain its uh, the fact that it was about the origin, it was centered on the origin, um, and we wanted to change the dimension of the side while keeping all four sides equal, then we would have to change every single one of those dimensions. But now, if we come in and we change this to 60, it changes all four sides and it moves it, moves the sides out so it's still centered on the origin. That is how you you make a really stable model and a model that's really easy to come back in and edit. So thank you for turning into this tutorial. If you guys enjoyed it, do me a favor and please click the like and subscribe button and the notification bell if you would like to get notified when I upload more content. Really appreciate you watching the video and uh, I look forward to seeing you guys on the next one.